This presentation, just to make sure you're in the right room, um, is Jan Ulrich and Rick's two dogs. And Jan is going to be sharing what's new in uh, the version three of the new Lakota dictionary. Um, Jan is not able to be with us, but he has a few thoughts before we get started. Um, we're going to be sharing a, a video presentation, and then at the end, um, if you guys want to jot down any questions, we'll be doing a QA where Jan and Rick can answer any questions. We'll do a little bit of housekeeping just so I can run the mic to you so he can hear you for those of you that have questions. So let's get started. How many thoughts? John, do you want to say anything before we get started? Uh, yes, I would like to say something. Uh, Jamie might have forgotten to mention that uh, we do have two similar presentations, and that was a little bit of a misunderstanding. We really have just one presentation uh, for both the Rick and myself presentations that are given, papers are given on the agenda, but it is one and the same presentation. So if you are attending it today, uh, then uh, this morning, then the one that's in the afternoon is going to be the same presentation. And it is going to cover both the history of the dictionary as well as the new features in the third edition. And that session is thousands of examples, sentences that illustrate how we native speakers 
use words in the Lakota language thought process. As a Lakota language teacher, I know that learning verb conjugation can be a challenge for learners. And this is another reason to use this dictionary because it reliably shows the conjugation of every verb. Also, I have been teaching Lakota with the orthography used in this dictionary. And so I know from first-hand experience that it is very practical and effective in representing how we pronounce words. It helps the students to learn good pronunciation, which is key for expressing and understanding differences in meaning. This dictionary also provides the variations used by our Dakota relatives, and I think it is very interesting to see both the similarities and differences among our dialects. I am happy to see how many of us native speakers participated in documenting words and sentences in this dictionary because this resource will continue to help future generations of Lakota people to keep our language alive. I applaud everyone involved with the dictionary project, the elders who offered their time and shared stories and words, our young people who contributed comments on typos in the previous editions or recordings of their relatives, the IT specialists who helped develop the app version grant writers who found funding to support the work, and the editor who provided critically needed linguistic oversight. The dictionary resulting from this team effort is truly wonderful. It is a detailed record of our language that will continue to be a reliable source for generations to come. I would like to encourage all of our young people to actively engage in learning our beautiful language and to always be supportive of anyone who wants to learn. If you put your heart and your mind to it, you can learn our language, and by doing so, you will make both your ancestors and your descendants are very happy. Richard Tudolos. Uh, next, I would like to share some of the history of the New Lakota Dictionary development. I would like to start uh, by telling you a story, because there is usually a story behind the production of most books, and the New Lakota Dictionary is no different. The story of this dictionary is, more than anything else, a story of Lakota elders who decided to share their knowledge for a project they believed in. Some of the people I will mention in the following section are unfortunately no longer with us. Therefore, I will follow the traditional protocol and offer food and tobacco to the spirits. So, here is the story. The idea of a new dictionary for the Lakota language was initiated by a group of elders who wanted a dictionary that would be comprehensive, reliable, linguistically sound, and culturally relevant. The first of these elders was Rudy Farthler. I met Rudy in 1992 during my first visit to Lakota country. I had been learning Lakota for seven years prior to that, merely out of my personal interest in the language and culture. After we met, Rudy really enjoyed having Lakota conversations with me, so we spent hours at a time talking. I always had a little notebook with me and took notes on the words and phrases I had heard from him. And later each day, I checked these notes against the written sources I had used previously in my self-study. This is when I started noticing that many things didn't match, and I showed some of these issues to Rudy. He was very intrigued by this and suggested that we spend some time looking through the older dictionaries and discuss the words recorded there. At one point, Rudy introduced me to his Taashi, John, around him, and the three of us would sit for hours at the Piawi Choni dancing grounds and go from entry to entry. This is when Rudy and John suggested that a new dictionary should be made and that I should help with it. I protested, saying that I didn't have any background in descriptive linguistics or in lexicography, so I wasn't in a position to help. My interest in learning the language was personal, and it had never been my intention to work on a Lakota dictionary. But Rudy 
Moody and John insisted that I should continue to do this type of research that we were working on together. And so I started converting my notes into a lexical database. And for the next several years, I continued to extend the database by words found in open texts and recordings. All these additions were eventually cross-checked by other native speakers. I bought books about lexicography and I continually educated myself on the field. I also started pursuing a degree in formal linguistics in addition to my previous background in second language acquisition. During the early 90s, there were other native speakers besides Rudy and John around here that shared their knowledge for this project, so I would now like to talk about some of these. Edda Little Thunder was originally from Rosebud, but she lived in Rapid City when I met her in 1992. Edda was a fluent speaker, but she was also very interested in studying the language from a conceptual point of view. She had a library full of books on the language, including Doria's text collection. We read almost the entire book together, discussing the meanings of words and sentences. She enjoyed this very much and invited me to stay in her house so that we could spend more time working on the language together. I took meticulous notes of all of her comments, and her contribution was invaluable. And of course, her friendship was greatly cherished. She also introduced me to many of her relatives in Rosebud, including Bill and Phoebe Littlefinger. They too were helpful in sharing their knowledge, so I was able to document many words uh, while having conversations with them. I also spent a good deal of time in the Greengrass community in Chan River, recording many words uh, from the local elders and families. This is also where I met Dave Chief, who contributed words to the dictionary as well. Towards the end of the 1990s, there were about 10,000 entries in the database. At that point, I printed a draft of the dictionary and took it to OLC and SGU to ask whether they would be interested in taking over the project or collaborating on it. <coughs> Although nothing official evolved from this, a number of OLC instructors offered to help with the project, namely Wilbur Mestith and Calvin Jumping Bull. Calvin was very knowledgeable about the language, and he shared information on a number of very important words. His insights also made it possible to apply morphological patterns on other words. Wilmer Mestith spent extended periods of time working as a consultant for the project. We used to hang around the large shaded area at his house, or sit in his kitchen, often while he was cooking his favorite vegetable soups. In 2001, the Lakota Tribal Council adopted a resolution that supported the founding of the Lakota Language Consortium. When a group of elders finally founded the organization in 2003, I was invited by them to help with creating a curriculum and various pedagogical products. So I interrupted my postgraduate program in order to be involved with this. The LLC elders endorsed the dictionary project and we set out to pursue it more seriously, even with the limited funding we had. An old RV parked next to Wilmer Mestiz's house was the first LLC office and a lot of dictionary editing took place right here, both during hot summers without running air conditioning and in some very cold winter weather. Before the publication of the first edition in 2008, almost 300 speakers shared their knowledge for the dictionary. The research has been continued to this day when the lexical database has 60,000 entries and over 41,000 of them will be in the third edition. Let me now continue talking about the real authors of the project. I have always emphasized that the native speakers are the authors of the dictionary. It's been a privilege that I was asked by elders to be the editor and to be able to work with so many native speakers. But I am just an editor that organized the lexical data and provided linguistic oversight. One of the many great things about this project is that it's connected so many wonderful people. They each may have different personalities, worldviews, and lifestyles, but they all share one thing in common, their love for the language and their desire that the language is documented and taken into the future by the younger generations. Let me talk about a few more of the elders who made major contribution to the dictionary. Ben Blackbear Jr. has been one of the LLC board members since the beginning, 
and for the past 17 years, he has been involved as the main consultant for the dictionary. His input has been invaluable, and he is the epitome of Lakota scholar. He combines the intuitive knowledge of a native speaker and a high level of systematic metalinguistic knowledge. This puts him in a unique position to work on this type of project. Ben's support for the project and his contribution to the dictionary content have been immeasurable. Needless to say that Ben provided his voice for the recordings of words offered in the app version of the dictionary. The amount of time, effort, and passion that Ben gave on behalf of the various Lakota language projects has no comparison. Johnson Hollyrock was a renowned tribal leader who served as a Lakota language consortium board member from the very beginning until his passing in 2012. His father was born in a teepee while the people were still camping in the Powder River area in Montana and lived through the Battle of Little Bighorn. So Johnson learned Lakota from people who remembered the Battle of Hunting Days. This is why he used a lot of old words and many of them were documented in the NLD. My only regret is that we didn't have more time to document more of the language from elders like Johnson. Words can hardly describe the incredible contribution made to the dictionary by Dolores Taken Live. I met Dolores in 2005 when I started documenting the Standing Rock dialect. I knocked on the door of her house one day and started talking to her in Lakota explaining about the project. She was immediately intrigued and invited me in. After recording a story and working with me on a number of entries, she invited me to come again, saying she was very interested in contributing more to the dictionary. We eventually ended up working on the dictionary for days on end, and she invited me to stay in her house so that I didn't have to sleep in the car and we could maximize our time working on the project. This started 16 years of a very close friendship. During this time, Dolores worked on the dictionary not only when I visited her in Standing Rock, but also via phone calls on a regular basis. And when it happened so that I didn't call her for a while because I was too busy, she had one of her relatives eye me and ask me to call her. Dolores simply loved working on the dictionary and could never get tired of doing so. She checked and contributed to a vast number of word entries and her insights into word meanings were invaluable. She epitomized the meaning of the Lakota value Boa Chantuknake. Dolores was also a vocal advocate of the orthographic standardization, and our discussions eventually evolved into the idea of the Lakota Summer Institute. Dolores was one of the most eloquent Lakota elders of the 21st century. It is very sad that we lost Dolores to COVID-19 in August 2020. Robert Tuko worked as a consultant on several thousand entries. He is the epitome of the Lakota virtue of Wawachitaka, the patience he had for all the linguistic questions and for providing examples was beyond measure. He was very determined to offer as much of his time as possible. On top of this, his contribution to the Kili Radio Lakota Hour is priceless. Darling Last Horse from Kyle is from a traditional family in which the language was used as the only language for most of her childhood and youth. This is why her personal lexicon is wide-ranging as well as deep in with meanings. She's always been very kind in sharing her time and knowledge, both when I visited her and over the phone. Iris Chasing from Cherry Creek provided her voice for the female version of the recordings in the dictionary app. During this work, she offered valuable comments on the words and entries. She also offered a large number of idiomatic expressions and old words. As a Lakota Language Consortium board member of many years, she also helped shaping the mission and the direction of the organization and the dictionary project. Dave Bald Eagle from Cherry Creek was raised by his grandfather, Chief White Bull, who was sitting Bull's nephew. His language reflected those deep connections with that generation. While deeply rooted in the traditional life and culture, Dave also had a wide scope of experiences with and knowledge of the modern world. Again, the only great regret is that there wasn't more funding that would provide for more time with elders like him. 
Kenny Little Thunder was a great supporter of the project, and his wife Bernadine continues to be involved with it as a consultant. They came regularly to the Latifa Summer Institutes, which provided many opportunities for them to comment on entries, give feedback, and record new words. Ray and Dolores text were born and were humble in Chevoyate from Cairo. Their Lakota was eloquent, showing they used it extensively throughout their lives. They were very happy to share their linguistic knowledge. I met Mel Longhill in 1992, and we kept in touch until his passing in February 2018. He came from a family that kept alive many words that had been forgotten elsewhere. My favorite story is about the word giba, to regret something or to suffer the consequences of one's own actions. Ella Deloria documented this word in the 1920s, but between 1992 and 2007, I was unable to find a native speaker who would confirm this word. In 2007, I recorded yet another story from Mel, and in it he said, Yankibakte. After the narrative, I asked Mel what the word meant, and what he provided was exactly what Deloria wrote in the 1920s. The next day, I checked the word with his brother Everett, who lived by the Porcupine Butte, and he confirmed it. Mel was always happy to visit in Lakota and share his knowledge of words, and so is his sister Vaina, who has also been consulted on many entries. I met Mary Ann Redcloud in 1992, and she provided her insights on hundreds of entries. She was really great to work with. Robert Lettenbull from Spring Creek helped immensely with the documentation of the Rosebud dialect. Fern Ann Hollowhorn from Manderson provided many insights on a large number of entries. I would bring her food, coffee, and coffee filters, and we would sit in this little hut of hers and go from entry to entry. Florida Bober Jealous from Kyle offered her vast knowledge of words, idiomatic expressions, and various aspects of traditional life. She's always been very welcoming whenever I visited her and eager to work on the dictionary. Paulette Eitel from Arab Lightning Community consistently attended the Lakota Summer Institutes. She was a talented Lakota writer and helped as a consultant for the dictionary for over a decade. Regina Grant from Cannonball was one of the consultants for the Yankton Dakota dialect along with uh, wonderful people like Zona Lone's Arrow, Felix Kidder, and Richard Fulbert. I met Rick Two Dogs in 1992, but we really got to know each other more closely in 2018 during the Lakota Summer Academy at the OLC. Sometime after that, he started to help with the dictionary, and we've been holding regular weekly sessions. His contribution is beyond measure. He knows many idiomatic expressions with deep cultural meanings and has profound insights into word usage, morphology, and semantics. Working with Rick has been a great privilege. He is one of those wonderful elders who have shown a great passion for working on the dictionary. We've been going through, um, I guess, different words, the meaning, uh, it's a lot of, we did a lot of work with uh, conjugating <coughs> words and some concepts of the words, you know, it's been interesting and fun. You know, I like I like doing it. So I, I want to I want to share everything I can because I know it's being documented. You know, because uh, as we know, nobody lives forever. As I mentioned earlier, there are hundreds of other speakers, and it is not possible to mention all of them. But they are listed in the acknowledgement section of the dictionary. Since its publication in two thousand eight. The dictionary has been used by a growing number of Lakota language teachers and learners. As the following testimonials show, Hello everybody, my name is Laura Ketches. I am the Lakota Studies Director um, at Oglala Lakota County School District. Here we use the um, Lakota Language Consortium Orthography. Uh, we use the dictionary, we use all the materials um, to help us learn Lakota. Um, I have been personally using, I mean, this is the first orthography I've used to learn Lakota um, at a Lakota Language Summer Institute. And 
I have used it to learn um, Lakota and teach Lakota. So um, we are, you know, it is mandated to, to teach district wide here. And, and we are honoring uh, Levi Lefthand, who was um, my mentor and who is not here anymore, but he also um, saw, you know, firsthand and believed in the orthography and saw how it benefited the teachers as well as the students and just everyone learning Lakota. So I just want to want to say thank you to um, all the supporters and everyone who who you know takes the time to learn learn Lakota and um, as a part of language revitalization. The dictionary is just so amazing because um, you know you can look up any word that you need to on your cell phone. Um, I mean, using and having the book is it, just af offers additional um, you know learning pronunciation of each of the words is so important, especially in the school system. You, any learners don't want to mess up the words, so it's like they can press on the man version or the female version, um, and that's just phenomenal. Yeah, I'm just super grateful for the elders um, for, you know, taking the time um, to do the recordings, um, having that trust um, to, you know, that our, you know, people were going to use this for, for generations to come, um, and it just has been such a reliable resource, not only in my own learning, um, but, you know, in the entire district and anyone who's taking language learning seriously. Um, it's just one of the best tools that we can have. Yeah, the dictionary is uh, quite helpful. In fact, I'm teaching, I'm helping uh, Alan Wilson teach uh, Lakota language. And we're slowly working our way towards uh, the point of uh, getting people to use the dictionary. So uh, that's one of the things that we're doing. So yeah, the dictionary is becoming uh, more and more valuable. And especially uh, for the fact that it's on, uh, uh, you can get it on iPhone or, you know, um, one of your uh, devices. Um, I think that's uh, especially helpful because people can look up things right from basically on on the spot and uh, in real time. So uh, the dictionary is quite a valuable instrument, and of course, um, you know the fact that it's consistent. You know, it has uh, words, consistent spelling. Uh, it has uh, helpful uh, hints about uh, conjugating verbs and, you know, um, and uh, besides, you know, I uh, was writing the meanings of words. So, yeah, all, uh, all those are extremely valuable um, additions to the dictionary, and then we keep adding new words to it, you know. So, I think those are all extremely valuable uh, additions to the dictionary. So I hope that, uh, you know, more people will make use of that. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually uh, continue the process of learning the language through. I actually learned in the process of working with Jan on the dictionary because, uh, you know, sometimes he comes up with a word and I, I, that I'm not even aware of. So we talk about it and then we find it someplace, you know, and, and uh, uh, realize uh, what it means, and it's a new word, you know, that's still being used. So, you know, uh, um, so I, I uh, contributed that way in uh, developing the dictionary. You know, um, it is coming up with all these new words and uh, learning in the process, but realizing that uh, the words are still being used, you know, by the, by the speakers. So that's what makes it. Uh, uh, you know, good dictionary, and uh, I worked with Jan on it for many, many years. So we're still, I guess, you know, it's a developing thing. Wow.
dictionary. I was really excited about that because um, I can look up the words and translate, and they themselves can look it up and translate because it was written both in Lakota and in English. So they, of course, that some of them were not fluent, so they would look up the say it the or look up the English word and then and say it in Lakota, and that's where I was working with some young people. And I would help them with the pronunciation of the word. And, the, and of course, they could read the meaning in English. And then the, later on, they came up with the phone app. And boy, that really took off. So then we were able to text with these young students. They were like high school students. So they were able to communicate with myself and my husband at the time. So then I always remember how far it came from that year until today, and I have a lot of young people that still write to me in Lakota when they text me or when they Facebook me. I would speak to them in Lakota, and they're able to um, write back or speak to me in Lakota or write to me in Lakota, and I would write back in Lakota. And I feel really good inside that they're able to use this, whether it's the phone app or the, even looking at the dictionary stuff they have available. And I myself have family members that use those resources. They're really happy that they can get on their phone and look up the word and then teach themselves how to say it because even those are important. So I, that's what I think is so awesome about these dictionaries that they came up with and with the phone apps that go along with it. But to me, I think it's important that it's designed to where like our students, to, uh, like our Lakota kids today, if they're able to read the English language and they have the skills to read and uh, know where to put the diacritic marks and all of that. So when this came about, they were able to read it but actually know what was being taught to them, even by pictures, because I remember how colorful the workbook, workbooks were. So to me, I think that what was most important is that the children are the most ones that are going to learn from these, the way these books and, and dictionaries are made. Does it have anything to do with us as um, fluent speakers or well, adults that we should be really um, supporting, be supportive of this orthography because our kids can read it?
course, the main difference uh, lies in the number of entries. So if you compare the number of words that were present in the first edition published in 2008 with the number of entries that will be published in the third edition next year, uh, you will see that there is a major increase. The total number of entries in the first edition was 20,000. The total number of entries in the third edition will be 41,000. Now, the words unique to the NLD uh, are words that don't occur, that are not published in any other uh, Lakaba language dictionary. And there were 6,000 of these in the first edition, and there will be over 23 and possibly even 24,000 uh, unique words. And that means uh, these are words that would not have been otherwise documented if it weren't for the uh, for the collaborative efforts uh, among the Lakota Language Consortium and the many elders and people who contributed in one way or another. Uh, these words would not have been available. So, uh, just very briefly, here are some examples of unique words, unique to the NLD. Uh, of course, there are 23 plus thousand of them, so there is a lot, but just very briefly, uh, things like Aoa and Chincha to be slightly better recorded from Dolores Taken Live, Nuhchankichmu uh, to be purposely uh, deaf, like somebody doesn't want to hear the arguments or requests that's uh, recorded, documented from Johnson Holy Rock. We would be like on the verge of something also recorded from Johnson Hollywood. What that we are to treat people as relatives, documented from Rick Two Dogs uh, and many other things, for example, Kamnaya Eaya to win somebody over, documented from Shirley Left Hand, Awiwich uh, to think about things for oneself, to consider one's own things, documented from Dolores taken alive, up is a ha, everything went quiet all of a sudden, or there is a quiet surrounding us from Mary and Red Cloud, Jahalia from Robert Tucro, and I could continue and continue because there are a lot of words. Another major enhancement of the third edition is the comprehensiveness of the coverage of derived words. What are derived words? So, for example, uh, the verb ska, to be white, can be modified uh, into, uh, with the suffix ya, to become ska ya, being white, in a white state, in a white condition. And ska ya can be further der uh, derived into other forms. Similarly, the causative sky up to make something white, to paint some, something white, can have a number of other derivatives. Uh, we have done a lot of research in the past 10 years to uh, identify all possible types of derived words, and uh, we have done a lot of, we have put a lot of effort into covering all der derivatives in a very consistent, systematic way. So now, in the third edition, the derived words are covered very uh, comprehensively. Mm -hmm. Let me show you an example in the desktop app of the dictionary. Of course, these things can be found in the book as well, but it's just easier to show here on the screen. So if I search for ska, I find that the derived words listed at the end of each entry. And of course, you can click on any one of these entries and find the, I mean, any one of these derived words and find the et entry itself. So here we have sky out the causative and sky out the derived modifier. And of course, if you look, if you look up the word white on the English side, then under ska, you will also find the same derivatives and under sky up the derivatives of sky up. So basically, the derivatives are given in three places. They're in the dictionary. They're given at the end of the entry. Uh, they are given under each uh, uh, as an entry itself, 
Under that entry, there are new derivatives of the derived word, and they are also given uh, under the English entry as well. So uh, this is an important thing. And some words uh, have a lot of derivatives. Here we can see, for example, uh, a list of derivatives for the word for the verb Poyanka, you see, and you can see that here is even a longer list of the derivatives. Many language activists have made the dictionary project their own in various ways. For example, many have been in touch with the editor and have been sending comments about typos they had found, about their user experiences, as well as requests for future editions. A growing number of language activists also started interviewing their elders and recording stories from them, and subsequently sharing the content so that words documented in these recordings can be added into the dictionary. People like Travis Condon from Standing Rock, Alex Barthunder from Pine Ridge, Alan Wilson from Rosebud, the staff of the Immersion School in Pine Ridge, and many other people have contributed greatly to the dictionary in these various ways. It is our great hope that more language activists make efforts to document the language by recording dialogues or stories from their elders. We also hope that in the near future, there will be young Lakota people who become interested in linguistics and pursue a degree in the field. That way, one of the future Lakota linguists could eventually take over the editorship of the dictionary. What is the future of the dictionary project? There are still many words in our language that have not been documented. Many of them have deep meanings that express worldviews and concepts known by traditional native speakers. If these words and idioms are not documented, they will be forever lost. And with them, we will lose important concepts embedded in the Lakota language. Recently, there have been a lot of arguments over various aspects of Lakota language revitalization. Many people argue about orthographies and methods and invest a lot of time and energy into these arguments. This is not constructive and it does result in finding solutions. And while people spend time arguing and trying to tear each other down, native speakers and elders are leaving us at an accelerated speed due to COVID-19. If only we can spend the same amount of time and energy on finding solutions and on further documenting the language from these elders who are still with us, that would be so much more constructive and result in better outcomes. One way to do this is to put away our differences, to agree to disagree on details, but to show each other respect and support because we all share the same vision, taking the beautiful Lakota language into the future. Furthermore, the future of the dictionary and the work on the language depends on our actions. In order for the dictionary to continue to grow, it is important to find young Lakota people who will take it upon themselves to study linguistics and achieve skills and knowledge that would enable them to work as editors of the dictionary and researchers for the language. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you all for your uh, attention. If anyone has questions for Jan or Rick, um, you can come up and ask them on the microphone. I can run it back, but with the audio, you kind of have to run back and forth. So, does anyone have questions? Um, we also have Ben Blackbear here, and Alan Wilson is here. If there's anyone else that was mentioned in the video that's in the room, I'm sure they're happy to answer any questions as well. The, the question was, is the third edition available now? And the answer is, it's not available quite yet. So we had hoped to have it ready to go in fall, uh, but with the 
additional auditions that we're having, it's going to be early next year um, that we'll be releasing that. Um, we're working to get the updates into the global dictionary, uh, first and foremost, and then the printed dictionary um, as, as soon as possible after that. So it's a little bit more of a, it's a lot a longer process, and maybe y'all can speak to that um, when it comes to um, printing an actual dictionary. Right, the printing's going to take a bit that we hope for early next year, but uh, if you download the latest versions of the apps, uh, mobile apps or desktop app, they, uh, the content and the functionality is close to what you will see in the book version for next year. Ben has a, Ben wants to talk here. Yeah, uh, this is Ben Blanker, Junior. Uh, I just wanted to add an additional comment to what Jan was just telling us. Um, we do want linguistics um, education to work on dictionaries, to work on the grammar, and different things. But one of the things I think we also need to realize is to be a, a Kota language teacher, you do not need to be a linguist, okay? You need to go to school and learn how to teach. So being a Lakota language teacher, you don't have to study linguistics. You know, that's what they're gonna teach you is they'll teach you how to teach. The the linguistics app or his science and what she just science answers yet. So, hey, oh, why all not be a Spanish teacher in the dictionary? Yeah, he won't watch the channel. Where he ash la co extra la coya won't speak. I can't be a cheap hunters or while I walk here la cotia won't speak. We chuck here behave channel Spanish teacher. Well, it should be that if we had a language. I just wanted to make sure that you understand that there's a difference between a linguist and a language teacher. Okay, <laughs> language teachers are not linguists. Okay, they learn a little bit about linguistics, but you know, basically they teach you how to teach, and that's an important aspect. And if you want to get deeper into it, then you, of course, you go into linguistics. Greetings. <laughs> okay, um, so I've been how many I've been on Chiang Kapi, how many got there on Chiang Kapi, how many I've been on Chiang Kapi. Now, you have to be watching it on my Jews up low. So, um, I started learning Lokota about six years ago, uh, intensively. And I attended a Lakota Summer Institute up in Standing Rock. And uh, you know, me and Ben were the only two there from Rosebud. <laughs> uh, but it was really good. It was, it was really good. And uh, you know, growing up, I always had this, uh, you know, I grew up in the 90s. So we were always drilled about our pronunciation on Lakota. And that kind of um, really instilled in me this fear to speak Lakota, you know. And you're not saying it right, I was going to get hit. <laughs> but, but now you mom, you said she may. Oh, so, um, but um, yeah, one time she left us at the carnival and. Just put this all out there. We had to go up to the stand and we were just crying. So, if there's any cops out there, right there. <laughs> just kidding, Mom. Um, no, but I, I got back and, um, you know, my, after my first year um, there, you know, it was three weeks and ten, they called it Lakota Language Boot Camp. And uh, I got back and I was just excited, you know, I was really excited to do the homework on writing Lakota, you know. Really gave a really good effort, and the way it was structured and the way it was set up was really helpful. And um, so immediately I got back and I was sharing with with mom, you know, Ata, she's just, <laughs> she's just really spoke.
so forgotten. Did you understand what I said? No? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I mean, I'm still processing it, you know. But, um, you know, now we're able to have conversations in Lakota. You know, and it's, it's really awesome to hear. Um, especially when she's upset and getting mad at me. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, no, this dictionary here is, is um, really been helpful in my learning, you know, um, for me. And I think everyone can benefit from it, to be honest, um, and really learn a lot from it. Um, you know, one of my main concerns, again, was saying it right, and the orthography that Ben and the others decided to use for it was actually, um, it's really helpful, you know, um, for me as a learner, so I don't mispronounce it. So through that program, I became a Lakota language teacher. And it's been um, really awesome to inspire the youth and people to learn Lakota. And it's been really, really great experience. And I know these words come from elders, and I know that I'm helping carry that on. And Ben, shout out to Ben here, he has been a really awesome mentor for me. And we have you teach a grammar class, we've taught many classes together. So I just, um, again, really grateful. And if you can uh, check this dictionary out, it's really awesome. I'd just like to say, and uh, this dictionary has been an invaluable resource to our people, and even in Dakota, our Isayanti dialect has uh, entries and for all the words. They have a Dakota uh, entry too, and uh, we were relying upon the, the Riggs dictionary for uh, many, many decades now. And this dictionary has uh, helped us with our language, and I view it as a tool to uh, help people. Uh, the dictionary is not going to save our language; it's just a tool for us to, when you can't remember a word, because you know you can't remember every word. Uh, we forget things; we're human, and so when we do. We look it up in this dictionary because you know a lot of our elders are leaving us now and we write all these words down to preserve them for future generations because there's going to be a time when uh, we need to remember something we look it up in this dictionary so I, I view it as a very good tool to help preserve and save our language for future generations and uh, you know I, I agree with what they were saying here about how we should uh, put aside our differences and just come together to save our life. It doesn't matter what orthography you're using. Let's all work together for the common good, which is keeping our language alive. And you know, I, I just want to say thank you to uh, these people for making this resource. And also, I'm, I'm working with them on a Dakota Dictionary app right now. So we'll have one for Isayanti dialect. Uh, here shortly, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. And uh, I just want to say that uh, these few words to share with you from my, my opinion, this is what I think. So, and I hope that we shot the Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Hart? Thank you all for attending this session. Um, this same presentation will be on at 1.30.
Um, if any of you all are teachers, I'm going to be doing an Awilsape teacher training at the same time at, at the, at, I don't remember which room it is, um, but it's listed on the program. And then later today, we're going to be going over the digital resources that are available for Lakota language learning. There's a bunch of secret stuff that I think is forgotten or that is available and really accessible for free out there. And so we want to, we pulled a bunch of those resources together to do a presentation at 4 o'clock on that as well. So hopefully that will arm you all with plenty of stuff to take back and share with your community. So um, if you guys, thank you all for attending and we appreciate your time. Oh. Oh. Hello, Ryan. Long time no see. Um, this is Babette. Hey, um, I wanted to just thank you for recognizing Grandpa Johnson. Um, it's really heartfelt. It, um, my mom's mom was a Holy Rock, Grandpa Johnson's older sister, so I wanted to thank you for um, recognizing him. Open up to a chicken. Thank you for your words. Yes, uh, I have the greatest memories of Johnson, and, and his contribution to the language is immense. So, you know. And my trunke here. I'd like to thank you for recognizing my mother. It surprised me to see her picture come up there, but she was a fluent speaker. And I think Mom, I took a class with Ms. Mr. Richard Two Dogs, and um, he wanted us to record a story from an elder, so I told my mother, I said, you two record a story from him. And she said, uh-huh. So she told two stories, and then one of them was so comical, but what really did happen, and person, Mr. Two Dogs, started laughing, and he said, is that for real? So I said, yep, and he, he couldn't stop laughing. I would tell you the story, but we don't have enough time. But I thank you for recognizing all these elders, all these men and women for putting this all together because some of us were getting back into fluency because we're teaching in our classrooms also and trying to sell it to our students the importance of the Lakota language. And as my brother-in-law used to say, the late Mr. Dale looks twice, the beautiful Lakota language. I'm a duck ram beach and there was the number two zombie. Um, I'm glad to be here. We're from uh, the Sea Travel along with Ben Black Bear. And uh, I just wanted to um, tell you a long time ago when we went home from the boarding school, well, we, were, we weren't allowed to speak our language and we were punished for speaking our language, but so when we went home, we spoke English. And my grandma and grandpa didn't like that, you know, and uh, my aunts and uncles also. And I remember one time my um, Uncle Ross was um, cooking supper with his wife, and he had my grandma's apron on and he was really cooking and then they got finished and just then we went outside and he opened the door and he peeked out and he said, hey, English, English, it's time to come and eat. <laughs> I always remember that. And so, but um, I don't know if Ben ever put together the word chokni, chokni bread. I think we talked about it once before, and um, when it was real hot and people didn't have air conditioning or electricity way back when, and so in the summer they put their uh, kitchen stoves outside, and they would cook on the stoves while it was, you know, very hot and and making bread and. Uh, so I guess that's 
where the, the word trophy bread came from. Well, thank you for listening to me.